Another wonderful short story about time loops is Kate Wilhelm's Nebula award-winning Forever Yours Anna, in which a handwriting expert falls in love with a signature that hasn't been written yet. And in the Nebula award-winning Schrodinger's Kitten by George Alec Evinger, an Arab girl is entangled in overlapping loops of diverging futures. Boy, Nancy, the Nebula Awards sure love time travel, don't they? Oh, that's right. Joe Haldeman's Nebula winner, The Hemingway Hoax, has a writer who is, well, as a professor who travels in a, no, let's call Joe up. He wrote it, he can explain it. Hi, Joe, it's Rick. Can you synopsize The Hemingway Hoax? Well. I know it's a, it's a toughie. It's a real short book. Yeah. <laughs> the plot synopsis is about a, there's a professor, a Hemingway professor at the University of Boston, and, and he comes up with the idea that uh, he could write Hemingway's lost novel. Uh, Hemingway, in real life, Hemingway lost all of his first three years' worth of work. His wife, Hadley, put them in a, in a uh, suitcase and went to meet him in Switzerland for skiing, and, and somebody stole the suitcase. And so he lost all of his early work. And people have been looking for it for 75 years. Well, my guy decides he could type up these stories on a 1923 Corona. Right. And uh, do them on sufficiently old paper and say, by George, I found these in an attic in Paris and make millions of dollars. The problem is when he starts this, this guy comes, this guy appears in a railway car and says he's a sort of a time policeman. He's actually a literary critic with a license to kill. And he says, you must not do this. If you do this, I will kill you. And he says, oh, yeah, sure you will. So he kills him. And he reappears in another universe where everything is slightly different. They have DeSotos in this universe. And, and uh, uh, Reagan was killed by an assassin, and George Bush became president, and the United States went to war in the Middle East and so forth. And, and he lives these two pasts simultaneously. Well, he writes another couple of pages of this book, and here comes the old Hemingway policeman again and kills him again, and then he reappears again as a third person. And he, the same people are in his life, but they're changing. What he doesn't realize is he's changing too. The, everybody is going in various asymptotic patterns. The, the bad guy is becoming more and more purely evil. The good girl is becoming more and more purely good. And he is becoming Ernest Hemingway. What inspired you to write such an intricate story? Was it sparked by one of Hemingway's tales? My model for the book was uh, Robert Heinlein, not Hemingway. Heinlein's stories all use zombies and uh, uh, by his bootstraps. Great time travel paradox stories. And I love Hemingway's writing, and I'm fascinated with his life, so it was a lot of fun to be able to use that as uh, material. And it, I enjoyed writing these little pastiches of the lost Hemingway stories, too. Well, they were fun to read. Thanks, Joe. Mm, don't mess with Mother Nature or Father Time. There are problems and paradoxes and emotional complications. In Kit Pearson's recent novel, A Handful of Time, a young girl from Toronto whose parents are divorcing is transported back to meet her mother as a child. The book is big in Japan. Maybe they figure Patricia's a sci-fi Anne of Green Gables. In Kurt Vonnegut's hilarious and heartbreaking Slaughterhouse-Five, Billy Pilgrim is a victim, unstuck in time by the horror of the firebombing of Dresden in World War II. And the blitz bombing of London is the setting for Firewatch, Connie Willis's Nebula award-winning novelette about students who leap back for a lesson in history and end up learning about life. In Connie's new novel, The Doomsday Book, her protagonist, Kivrin, travels back to England during the Dark Ages and the Black Death. Connie, it's Commander Rick. Why do your time travelers like Kivrin tend to get their hands dirty messing with the past? Well, I think one of the, one of the things that I try to deal with in my time travel books is that um, you can't be a detached observer. There's no such thing. Um, time travel novels in which you're not allowed to lift a finger to prevent oh, an animal being beaten to death or, or a child being killed are, are I don't think, realistic because um, I think that you would have to develop 
the I am a camera mentality, which would turn you into sort of a monster. The detached observer is in, in fact, a monster. And nobody, I don't think anybody had ever thought about that. The air that you breathe, <laughs> the air that you breathe out, these things affect and change the past. So, so you have to cope with that, you know, somehow. I mean, those are, that's why we have the paradoxes and why we probably could not have time travel. But um, if you can't overcome them, you can't write a time travel novel. <laughs> so I did the best I could. But Kivern, I think, faces the, the problem that she must, um, she must not be detached, but she must not be sucked in at the same time. And it's an impossibility. You can't. You can't be fully involved in the past. It can't be alive for you unless you truly um, let it hurt you. Well, you really feel for Kivrin. She's always fighting the temptation to tell people that humanity will survive the right. plague. Right. Yeah, that's the one thing she can't. She has a, a true advantage in the, in the Black Death, which is she knows what's going on. She understands what the history is. She realizes that, that although she doesn't know the fate of these particular people, that she does know the fate of the world and that it didn't end. And that is a theme that, that we are children in the dark. We, we don't know how it's going to end. And we are caught in, in our own time um, without having any idea what, you know, it's so easy to look back. I love books that are written about the 1930s and say, well, it's clear that, you know, the specter of war was rearing its ugly head here and here and here and here. And you're going, yeah, well, it's clear now. But it wasn't clear then. And that's, the, that's what people were trying to cope with was, they, they didn't know what was significant or not. You know, we're probably focusing on AIDS in the ozone layer, and we should be paying attention to some little two-inch uh, news story about something totally different that is actually the crucial event that, that later on we'll look back and we'll say, well, if, we, if we'd been paying attention, we would have realized. But that's what living in time is like, and that's, I think, uh, time travel gives you the opportunity to have, to show that if you have a perspective on time, uh, you have a tremendous advantage, while at the same time you still remain a prisoner of your own your own pr time, your own story. You still don't know the end. Well, you once said you'd be happy spending the rest of your days just writing time travel tales. In fact, I read you're now working on a time travel comedy. Yes, I hope so. One always hopes with comedy. Um, yeah, I decided I couldn't take the plague anymore, and it was time to do the flip side of time travel. I think there are many very funny aspects, particularly when you get into people who are are um, messing with messing with time and then thinking that they can fix it and of course fixing it will only make it worse as in all good comedies um, i have a a time traveler who has gotten badly time lagged because he has been going back and forth between the present and the past and he's been passing you can't be in you can't be in the same place twice but you can be very close and the closer you get um, the more time lag symptoms you're going to show so he's been doing um, he's been excavating um, the remains of Coventry Cathedral right after the Nazi bombing. And as a result, he's just a wreck. Um, and so they send him, he thinks, on R&R &R to Oxford in the 1880s so that he can just rest in peaceful Victorian England, do a little boating on the Thames, calm, restful, peaceful. Of course, this doesn't quite work out the way he'd hoped. He isn't actually there for that at all. He's actually there to try and rectify a disaster and uh, the disaster everything he does to rectify it only makes it worse um, and lots of I hope it will be lots of fun and the title the title is to say nothing of the dog or how we found the bishop's bird stump at last <laughs> okay thanks Connie thank you time travel allows authors to play with problems of logic or satirized cultures or show that individuals making small actions can make a difference the past may or may not be close to us, but science fiction authors have a device that allows them to live far into the future and to talk to people who aren't even born yet. These devices require no batteries and they fit in your pocket. Unless, of course, you buy the original hardcover editions. It was in Warwick Castle that I came across the curious stranger who I'm going to talk about. He attracted me by something. Next week on Second Nature, a new study shows that men have larger, heavier brains than women. The extra mass is apparently used to remember sports scores. Plus, black holes in space. Could they account for the socks missing from your dryer?
coming up on TV.